amyloidosis awareness. Throughout our lifetime, our DNA codes for the production of small molecules called proteins. These proteins provide the structure and function for nearly all of life's biological processes. Once proteins are made in our cells, they naturally fold into a particular shape. This shape allows for their specific function in the body. When proteins are folded properly, they work as they should, and we enjoy good health. When proteins are misfolded, it can impair our body's normal functioning, and problems may arise over time. Our bodies are usually pretty good at identifying and removing abnormal proteins. In some cases, though, we either produce too much of the abnormal proteins for our bodies to handle, or we're not able to break down and clean up the proteins at all. Amyloidosis is just one class in a growing list of protein folding disorders. While there are many types of amyloidosis, in all cases the misfolded proteins called amyloid, meaning starch-like, take on a particular shape that makes them very difficult to break down. Because of this misfolding, amyloid proteins bind together to form rigid linear fibrils that ultimately build up in our tissues and organs. Depending on where the amyloid accumulates, such as in the kidneys, heart, nerves, or gastrointestinal tract, different symptoms become apparent as those organs are affected. Left untreated, amyloidosis is life-threatening, so early, accurate diagnosis is key in promoting positive outcomes. Currently, over 25 different proteins have been identified that can lead to amyloidosis. The many types of amyloidosis can be classified according to the precursor protein that is misfolding. A simple naming system is used, such that the prefix A refers to amyloid, followed by an abbreviation for the protein underlying the condition. In AL, or primary amyloidosis, the most commonly diagnosed form of the disease, the amyloid is derived from misfolded light chain antibodies. White blood cells in the bone marrow, called plasma cells, are producing too many defective light-chain proteins. The kidneys, heart, liver, GI tract, and nerves are most often affected. In AA, or secondary amyloidosis, the disease results from increased levels of circulating serum amyloid A protein. The body produces this protein as a natural response to chronic infection or inflammation. The kidneys and liver are the main sites of amyloid deposition. In ATTR amyloidosis, the amyloid originates from the transthyretine protein, which is produced in the liver. In hereditary or familial forms of the disease, there are over 100 genetic mutations already discovered as contributing to amyloid formation, which primarily cause nerve damage and heart problems. A non-hereditary form of the disease, known as senile systemic amyloidosis, results from TTR amyloid building up in the hearts of the elderly. Whether caused by genetic factors or increasing age, TTR-mediated amyloidosis is actually thought to be more common than AL amyloidosis, though it often goes undiagnosed. Amyloid also sometimes deposits in isolated areas, such as the bladder or airways, without evidence of a systemic disease. These localized tumor-like deposits are made up of light-chain proteins similar to AL amyloidosis. In this case, the plasma cells producing the amyloid are in the affected tissues, not in the bone marrow. Many physicians will not expect to see amyloidosis in their clinical practice. Yet, for example, because TTR amyloid is often undiagnosed in patients with heart failure, it's very likely that the disease is much more prevalent than now recognized. The symptoms of amyloidosis are usually vague and nonspecific, such as weight loss, fatigue, shortness of breath, foamy urine, swelling of the ankles and legs, and numbness or tingling in the hands and feet. Because these symptoms mimic those of other common conditions, often being mistaken for heart, lung, or kidney disease, it's not uncommon for a patient to see several physicians before a biopsy is taken. But 
If there is kidney, heart, nerve, gastrointestinal or liver disease with no obvious cause, it should absolutely prompt physicians to test for amyloidosis as part of the differential diagnosis, the four most common clinical settings in which amyloidosis should be considered are 1. Loss of massive amounts of protein in the urine 2. Stiff or thickened heart Low voltage on electrocardiogram Irregular heartbeat with normal or low blood pressure or unexplained heart failure 3. Enlarged liver without alcohol consumption or other explanation often with abnormal liver blood tests. And four, numbness or pain in the fingers or toes, such as carpal tunnel syndrome, or alternating bouts of constipation and diarrhea, while also feeling lightheaded when standing up. The gold standard for detecting amyloid deposits is to employ Congo red staining on a tissue sample. The easiest way to get a sample is to aspirate fat from the abdomen like a mini liposuction. Amyloid has a pink color when dyed with Congo red and a characteristic apple green by refringence when viewed with a polarizing microscope. This signature technique is able to diagnose amyloidosis in 70 to 80 percent of cases. If the fat pad aspirate is negative for amyloidosis but suspicion of the disease is high, a direct biopsy of the involved organ for example, the heart, kidney, or liver, should be done. If amyloid is present, the use of Congo red staining will yield a definitive diagnosis in nearly 100% of cases. Viewing the tissue sample with an electron microscope will also show the classic structure of amyloid fibrils, thus confirming its presence. Proving that amyloid is present in an organ is only the beginning of the process. Next, the type of amyloid causing the disease must be determined in order to plan for an appropriate individualized treatment. Recent advances in the field of proteomics promise to revolutionize the precise diagnosis of amyloidosis. Laser microdissection of Congo red positive samples, followed by mass spectrometry, is the premier technique in typing amyloidosis. LMD MS can be performed on any tissue sample, including a fat pad aspirate, if amyloid is present. Studies have shown that LMDMS can identify all known amyloid proteins with virtually 100% accuracy, as well as characterize new ones. All in all, with the possible exception of an enlarged tongue or bruising around the eyes, which are seen in a small percentage of cases, there are no telltale clinical signs of amyloidosis. However, regardless of a patient's symptoms, because of the unique staining and spectroscopic properties of amyloid proteins, it is a simple matter to test for the disease. Early and precise diagnosis is essential for patients to benefit from the many treatments now available. Depending on the type of amyloidosis, treatments may include chemotherapy, cardiac care, organ transplantation, or targeted drug therapy. In each case, the aim is to reduce or eliminate the supply of amyloid protein so that organ function can improve. There are three general approaches to disrupt the formation and deposition of amyloid, which vary according to the type of amyloidosis. The most common treatment interferes with the production of the precursor protein leading to the disease. The second method uses drug therapy, to stabilize the normal structure of the precursor protein, thus preventing it from misfolding into amyloid. The third strategy targets the amyloid directly, both circulating in the blood and deposited as fibrils in the tissues. By tagging and destabilizing the amyloid, one's body can potentially identify and remove the abnormal proteins more effectively. Given the complexity of the disease and that each case is different, it is recommended that treatment be performed in a medical center which has experience with amyloidosis. Alternatively, patients can have an initial evaluation at such a center with continued communication during treatment in his or her local community. For a free illustrated booklet that explains amyloidosis in more depth, please visit amyloidaware.com to download your copy and share with others.